hashtag blessed. How often do you see that hashtag on social media? After doing a simple Google, Google search, you find people posting about their sunny day, yummy meal, or that it's finally Friday. But what does it mean to be blessed as a follower of Christ? How does God's blessing affect how we live our lives? Tonight, we are going to explore the blessings that God bestowed on Joseph and his family. The lecture is divided into two divisions, Joseph in the famine, Genesis 47, 13 through 27, and Jacob and Joseph, 47, 28, 48 through 22. Let me pray over our time together. Lord, thank you for bringing us here to learn more about your word. Lord, I pray that you would be with me as I speak, that my words, um, that they would just be dust of the earth, Lord, but that your truths and your promises would stick with us this evening. God, I just pray that um, you would just be with each of us as we um, explore more of Joseph's life. In your name we pray, amen. So we find ourselves in Genesis 47. Joseph has reconciled with his family and they have moved to Egypt with God's blessing. The famine is still going and that is where we pick up in scripture. Let's go ahead and read Genesis 47, 13 through 26 and see what's got, what Joseph's reaction is to the devastating famine. There was no food, however, in the whole region because the famine was severe. Both Egypt and Canaan wasted away because of the famine. Joseph collected all the money that was to be found in Egypt and Canaan in payment for the grain they were buying, and he brought it to Pharaoh's palace. When the money of the people of Egypt and Canaan was gone, all Egypt came to Joseph and said, Give us food. Why should we die before your eyes? Our money is used up. Then bring your livestock, said Joseph. I will sell you food in exchange for your livestock since your money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph and he gave them food in exchange for their horses, their sheep and their goats, their cattle and donkeys. And he brought them through that year with food in exchange for all their livestock. When that year was over, they came to him that following year and said, We cannot hide from our land the fact that since our money is gone and our livestock belongs to you, there is nothing left for our Lord except our bodies and our land. Why should we perish before your eyes, we and our land as well? Buy us and our land in exchange for food, and we with our land will be in bondage to Pharaoh. Give us seed so that we may live and not die, and that the land may not become desolate. So Joseph bought all the land in Egypt for Pharaoh. The Egyptians, one and all, sold their fields because the famine was too severe for them. The land became Pharaoh's, and Joseph reduced the people to servitude from one end of Egypt to the other. However, he did not buy the land of the priests because they received a regular allotment from Pharaoh and had food enough from the allotment Pharaoh gave them. That is why they did not sell their land. Joseph said to the people, now that I have brought, bought you and your land today for Pharaoh, here is seed for you so you can plant the ground. But when the crop comes in, give a fifth of it to Pharaoh. The other four fifths you may keep as seed for the field and as for food for yourselves and your household and your children. You have saved our lives, they said. May we find favor in the eyes of our Lord. We will be in bondage to Pharaoh. So Joseph established it as law concerning land in Egypt, still in force today, that a fifth of the produce belongs to Pharaoh. It was only the land of the priests that did not become Pharaoh's. Before we took a hiatus into the reconciliation of Joseph and his family, we are dealing with a severe famine. Joseph had been made second in command to Pharaoh to help save Egypt during this time. Joseph had filled the storehouses and prepped Egypt for this point in the famine. He had stored up enough that the surrounding areas, such as the Israelites in Canaan, had come to seek food from Egypt. However, it seems weird in this passage that the general Egyptian public were not prepared now that the famine was in full, full rage mode. Some questions that spiked my interest were, did the Egyptians not save grain like Joseph did? Why did they not have enough money for food? What we do know is that Joseph had grain and the Egyptians had run out of money to buy the grain from him. They came to Joseph and pleaded for food. Joseph requested their livestock in exchange for food, and they willingly complied and went on their way for a year. But after the year, they came back with the same issue. This time, they did not have any livestock to exchange or money, so they offered Joseph the next best thing for food, their land, and themselves. 
So Joseph, Joseph took them up on their offer. The land became Pharaoh's and the people became servants. Joseph did not buy the land of the priests, however, because they were taken care of by Pharaoh. But he did ask one thing of the Egyptians, to plant seeds for a crop. Joseph instructed them that when the crop came in, they would give one-fifth to Pharaoh and keep the other four-half, four-fifths as a seed for the fields and as food for them and their families. I just want to go back and reflect on Joseph and the Egyptians' actions. Yes, if you're wondering, the Egyptians gave themselves over to servitude. They even claimed in verse 25 to Joseph, You have saved our lives. May we find favor in the eyes of our Lord. We will be in bondage to Pharaoh. The Egyptian people gave themselves over to servitude to survive the famine. From different commentaries, it seems to mean that the Egyptian people would not be owners of their land, but instead Pharaoh would own the land and the people would work it, somewhat like a share, sharecropper um, situation. I don't disagree that this kind of sounds awful, but I can see God's blessing on the Egyptian people through Joseph's actions. Yes, Joseph took the Egyptian people's land and had them work it for Pharaoh, but in turn, Joseph made sure the people kept four-fifths of the land for themselves. It seemed that this would have been a hard decision for Joseph to make, one that sometimes leaders have to make those hard decisions. And I bet that he agonized over what to do, but knew that the only way to provide for these people was through the division of labor. This meant that the people would have seed for the next year's crop, food for their family, and eventually food for their livestock as they continued to grow and prosper after the famine. God was working with Joseph to bless the Egyptians through his planning and organization. We know that God's blessings of the Egyptians through Joseph also blessed the Israelites. So let's circle back around to what are God's blessings? Are his blessings material objects? Favors granted by him? family and friends, prosperity, all the above. In Ephesians 1.3, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. God's blessings are salvation, grace, forgiveness, the Holy Spirit, and eternal life. We see God's blessings of grace through Joseph saving the lives of the Egyptians with his organization of the food and continued diligence in service to Pharaoh. Have you seen God's blessing through others around you? One that way that I have seen God's blessing is the provision of friendships. God has blessed me beyond measure with friends that are steadfast in the Lord. God blessed me with friends who have shown me grace and mercy when I have been wrong and led me back to the Lord through repentance and forgiveness. Just like Joseph took care of the Egyptians by providing for their needs, God does the same for us. Is there a challenging decision that you are facing? How is God leading you and blessing your obedience? Are you willing to follow God's lead on this challenging decision? Our principle for this section is, God's blessings often come through the faithfulness of others. God's blessings often come through the faithfulness of others. We see that this is evident in the way that Joseph cares for the Egyptians, and it's evident in the way that God cares for the Israelites. God's blessing in the past strengthened Joseph to help protect the Egyptians from the famine. However, God's blessing to Jacob in the past strengthen the Israelites to trust that God would provide for them in the famine. We read in Genesis 47, 27, Now the Israelites settled in Egypt in the region of Goshen. They acquired property there and were fruitful and increased greatly in number. What a difference the Israelites lived lives were compared to the Egyptians. The Lord blessed Jacob before he went to Egypt and the Lord kept his promise to keep and make him into a great nation. The BSF notes say that God in grace blesses his people with benefits from his bountiful hand. God's goodness to his people was obvious against the backdrop of famine and hardship. God blessed the Israelites and they were plentiful. We know that God's blessings in the past strengthen us to trust God with the future. We see that in the next division. Genesis 47, 28 through 48, 22. As Joseph promises Jacob and Jacob blesses Joseph and his sons. Let's read Genesis 47, 28 through 31. 
Jacob lived in Egypt 17 years, and the years of his life were 147. When the time drew near for Israel to die, he called for his son Joseph and said to him, If I have found favor in your eyes, put your hand under my thigh and promise that you will show me kindness and faithfulness. Do not bury me in Egypt, but when I rest with my fathers, carry me out of Egypt and bury me where they are buried. I will do as you say, he said. Swear to me, he said. Then Joseph swore to him, and Israel worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. God had encouraged Jacob to go to Egypt, promising that he would make him into a great nation and bring him back again. As Jacob grew older, he probably began to wonder how God's promises would play out. Jacob wanted to remind Joseph of the promises of Canaan. He wanted to make sure that Joseph knew the blessings that the Lord had for the Israelites in Canaan. Jacob does this by asking Joseph to return him home after he dies. When Joseph agrees, Jacob, Jacob worshipped. Jacob knew that the good life in Egypt could never compare to the blessings of the promised land. Just like Jacob, we all face the danger of falling in love with the world and forgetting to have an internal perspective. Jacob's reaction reminds us that we are not here to accumulate the things of this world, but to further God's kingdom by sharing the good news of Jesus Christ to every tribe, tongue, and nation. Jesus reminded us in Matthew 6, 19 through 21, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moths and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. We know the person who by faith lays up treasures in heaven is truly prosperous. This person is something that the world cannot give or take away. How does recalling God's faithfulness encourage you to trust Him with the biggest challenges that you face today? Maybe your biggest challenge is having an eternal perspective, or maybe it's listening to God's call in your life. I know for me, one of my biggest challenges is following God's plan and relying on His timing, not my own. As we move into chapter 48, we see how God worked through Jacob to hand his heritage in God to Joseph and his grandsons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Let's read Genesis 48, 1 through 22. Sometime later, Joseph was told, your father is ill. So he took his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, along with him. When Jacob was told, your son Joseph has come to you, Israel rallied his strength and sat up on the bed. Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan, and there he blessed me and said to me, I'm going to make you fruitful and will increase your numbers. I will make you a community of peoples, and I will give this land as an everlasting possession to your descendants after you. Now then, your two sons born to you in Egypt before I came to you here will be reckoned as mine. Ephraim and Manasseh will be mine, just as Reuben and Simeon are mine. Any children born to you after them will be yours in the territory they inherit. They will be reckoned under the names of their brothers. As I was returning from Padan to my sorrow, Rachel died in the land of Canaan, while we were still on the way a little difference from Ephrath. So I buried her there, there beside the road to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. When Israel saw the sons of Joseph, he asked, Who are these? They are the sons God has given me here, Joseph said to his father. Then Israel said, Bring them to me so I may bless them. Now Israel's eyes were failing because of old age, and he could hardly see. So Joseph brought his sons close to him, and his father kissed them and embraced them. Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face again, and now God has allowed me to see your children too. Then Joseph removed them from Israel's knees and bowed down with his face to the ground. And Joseph took both of them, Ephraim on his right towards Israel's left hand and Manasseh on his left towards Israel's right hand and brought them close to him. But Israel reached out his right hand and put it on Ephraim's head, though he was the younger. And crossing his arms, he put his left hand on Manasseh's head, even though Manasseh was the firstborn. 
Then he blessed Joseph and said, May the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd, shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has delivered me from all harm, may he bless these boys. May they be called by my name in the names of my father, Abraham and Isaac, and may they increase greatly upon the earth. When Joseph saw his father placing his right hand on Ephraim's head, he was displeased. So he took hold of his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. Joseph said to him, No, my father, this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He too will become a great people, and he too will become great. Nevertheless, his younger brother will be greater than he, and his descendants will become a group of nations. He blessed them that day and said, In your name will Israel pronounce this blessing. May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. So he put Ephraim ahead of Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joseph, I am about to die, but God will be with you and take you back to the land of your fathers. And to you, as one who is over your brothers, I give the ridge of land I took from the Amorites with my sword and my bow. Jacob decides to adopt Manasseh and Ephraim on his own and to bless them. We see that Jacob not only blessed Joseph, but blessed Joseph through this action. One of the greatest gifts parents can receive is the blessing of their parents interacting with their grandchildren. I know that Connor and I have enjoyed watching our parents be grandparents and their love for Emmett is overwhelming. I can only imagine Joseph's joy as Jacob claimed Manasseh and Ephraim as, uh, as his own. We also know from previous blessings, such as Jacob and Esau, that this blessing was important and part of the passing on of the family heritage. Jacob had not received the fulfillment of God's promises yet, but he was able to pass on his faith and the promises of God to his grandsons. As Christians, we can follow Jacob's example with our friends and family by sharing about our faith. It is important for us to share God's promises and work in our lives. Have you shared recently with friends or family how you've seen God working in your life or how he has blessed you throughout the study of Genesis? Jacob's blessing with his grandsons um, was not what Joseph expected. We notice that Jacob did not bless Joseph's firstborn Manasseh ahead of his brother Ephraim, but instead bless Ephraim instead of ahead of Manasseh. You might remember that Jacob was blessed before his older brother Esau, and that Isaac before his older brother Ishmael, and Seth before his older brother Cain. This seems to be a trend throughout Genesis, and you might be wondering why does it matter? It's very clear throughout Genesis that God put the individuals he was planning to work through in the places he intended them to be. By blessing the younger brother, the Lord is going against the customs of the time and not following birth order status. Even though we know that Joseph was following God's plan when his father Jacob blessed his youngest son above his oldest, he tried to fix Jacob's mistake, maybe thinking that Jacob was not able to see and not able to bless the correct son. Just like Joseph, sometimes we assume that God will follow the plan we have laid out in our minds. Sometimes we get caught up in what the traditions and norms are and forget that our God is a God of big plans and that he is always working behind the scenes in unexpected ways. Not only do we see God at work in Joseph's life, but we also see the heart change from Jacob. When we first met Jacob, he was trying to deceive his inheritance and blessing from his father Isaac with the help of his mother Rachel, even though the Lord had promised he would receive this blessing. Here we see Jacob consoling his son with acknowledging Joseph's quick reaction to what he thinks is a mix, a mixed up of the blessing. I think this shows that Jacob has learned to trust God's will. We know that God's blessings will be both on Manasseh and Ephraim. However, he knows that Ephraim's descendants will be a more powerful tribe. Jacob is able to console Joseph and encourage him to follow God's will and blessing for Ephraim and Manasseh. What a major difference from the sticky situation of Jacob and Esau. Jacob does the most important thing with his blessings of Joseph and his sons. He hands down the important heritage of faith and the promises of God. Our principle for this section is God's blessings often come in unexpected ways. God's blessings often come in unexpected ways. 
What do you do when God's answers and will for you are not what you expect? Do you respond like Joseph or do you respond like Jacob did in his old age? Wise to what the Lord was doing in Manasseh and Ephraim's lives. So let's return to the question, what are God's blessings? We know that God is our father. He created the earth and all that lives in it. He is a perfect father that loves us and cares for us. In Isaiah 43, one through three, it says, but now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt for your ransom. Cush and Seba in your steed. God has blessed us with promises and inheritances. We see this throughout the book of Genesis and next year as we study Matthew, we will see God's blessings through the life of his son Jesus. God has blessed us with an inheritance we carry with us today, the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, it tells us, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of salvation. Have you believed you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing your inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possessions to the praise of his glory. God's blessings of the Holy Spirit walks with us as we wait for Jesus to come again. Just as Jacob's blessing over Joseph and his sons encouraged them to wait and return to the promised land, we wait with the yearning for the day of the Lord to return. So maybe you're feeling hashtag blessed today and we praise the Lord for his many blessings in your life. Or maybe you are struggling and feeling that the Lord's blessings are out of reach. Whichever season of life you're in, hold tight to the promises of God that through faith in God and repentance of your sins, you have eternal life with Christ and that he will come again. But rest in Jesus' word in John 16, 33. I have told you these things so that in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Let me pray for us. Father, we just praise you for your word. We praise you for the leadership of Joseph and his um, just care for the Egyptians, Lord, and that four-fifths of crop that they were to keep. God, we just praise you for Jacob and his just blessing on Joseph and his sons, Lord. And we just praise you. Um, God, we just praise you for the many blessings. Lord, I just pray for those that are struggling right now, that you would just be with them, that you would guide them, that you would show them those little joys and blessings that you're putting in their life this week. God, I pray for those that are just in a, um, they are on top of the mountain with you, Lord, and they are just shining. Lord, I just praise you um, for that beautiful and that beauty in that season, Lord, and that they would just continue to seek um, your praise. God, I just pray that you would just be with us as we go throughout our weeks, um, that you would just bless us and keep us, Lord, and that we would just continue to praise your name. In your name, I pray. Amen. I hope you have a fabulous evening um, and a good week. We will see you next week. It'll be the last regular night of um, BSF for 2021 so far. And um, then we'll have share night. We love for you to join us for share night. If you want information for that, make sure to reach out to your group leader or you can email us at kc.youngadults.bsf at gmail.com. Have a great evening. Bye.